All right, everybody, welcome to the Sensitive Skin Beer Virus Reading Number Seven. And uh, one of our participants tonight is wondering why it was called the Beer Virus Reading. It's just like a dumb internet thing, right? Corona, beer. So I said beer virus instead of coronavirus. Just a way to keep us occupied while we're under quarantine. Uh, I don't know if I should allow people from Georgia to, to participate anymore since they can go to the tattoo parlor and nail salon now. Uh, uh, oh, hi, I'm Bernard Meisler. I am the editor in chief of Sensitive Skin Magazine. And you can find us online at sensitiveskinmagazine.com. And we've got all sorts of great uh, art, writing, and music. Uh, the folks who are participating tonight are, are all represented there. And, or will be very shortly. And uh, we've been doing these for, well, once a week. So I guess this is week seven. You can find previous weeks on YouTube, Sensitive Skin TV, one word. Uh, and, we, and we've had some great readers. We had, I don't know, off the top of my head, Gerald Nicosia, Bob Holman, uh, Sharon Mesmer. Um, yeah, John Trust, Jeff Wright. Jeff Wright's right there. This is the weird thing about Zoom, by the way. I was hearing somebody saying like why Zoom is terrible. I was reading one of those articles, why Zoom is terrible. And it's like, well, yeah, but it's better than nothing. And it's better than a phone call, right? But the thing about it that's weird is that all of you think that right now I'm looking you right in the eye, right? It's kind of weird, right? Even though I'm, yeah, there you go. Even though I'm, I'm, I'm looking at one of you or the other, but like I'm looking into the camera. So, uh, I think it's probably freaky at business meetings. Like if your boss is just like, you know, you think your boss is just like staring at you the whole time. It's hard to, hard to hide. Anyway, we've got a great show tonight. Uh, we've got uh, Amy Uzian. Uz uh, I messed it up already. It was uh, Uzian. Amy Uzian. Uh, Amy Barone and John S. Hall. And uh, let's get started. Enough of me already, right? Yeah, so... Our first reader is Amy Uzunian. I got it, Amy Uzunian. Uh, she's the author of two books of poetry, Your Pill from Foothills Publishing and Found in Phoenix, Fly by Night Press, and has edited four anthologies of poetry, art, and fiction. She edited issues seven, eight, nine, 10, and 13 of The Gathering of the Tribes magazine. I don't know what happened to issues 11 and 12, but she came back for 13. So. Uh, and she recently finished writing her first novel, Reckless Woman. She lives with her daughter and two black cats in Phoenix, Arizona. And she occasionally teaches yoga and meditation. All right, Amy, I unmute you and I make you the spotlight video. <gasps> wow. Amy Eugenian, here she is. Hi, everyone. Um, all right, so uh, I... I'm doing this on my phone because my daughter is watching Daniel Tiger uh, um, on my other computer. So um, I, I have two poems that I'm going to read from my last book, uh, Found in Phoenix. And then I'm going to switch to my Google Docs um, on my phone. So you might not be able to see me. I don't know how this thing works exactly. I hope that's okay, Bernard. Oh, that's okay with everyone. But, um, but uh, yeah, so. <sighs> First poem I'll be reading is Hemingway's Revenge. Lost baby's left shoe. Black patent leather. leather purchased from the children's place with white sock that says baby gap tucked inside. Last seen on the Uptown Avenue A train platform. If found, please contact your drunken uncle. He's been waiting in a holding cell since last May and can't remember what it's like to climb into bed with a woman who smiles when she says his name. So 
And then the next one that I'll be reading is the title poem for my book uh, called Found in Phoenix. Shining through a cut piece of ghetto diamond where a non-human person speaks is a language. And this is how we have always understood each other. It's been a month and two hours since I wrote you. My hat made by Chiapas Indian hands sticks with salty hair and grave sweat down to sun-beat skin. Back from Ajo again, and the same mongrel dogs greet us with their rat barks, angry that their copper dish is filled with dust and sun. Who will feed ours if theirs is starving? Suppose someone should throw a bone or a whole rooster with its cock-a-doodle-doo, just like the Fisher Price toy calls out every morning 5 a.m. alarm, but I guess the kids play World of Warcraft now. So what would they know about living without air conditioning or health insurance? And all the people are so clean here. They never worry about what will happen when the water runs out or when all the fancy cars are tragedies rolling in rust, spilling champagne from all of their lady parts into that grand old party. And I'll finish this Yankee off with a cabron kick to the chest because in the end we never mean to hurt. But fires cut and blades wear and guns do what God intended them to. And it only takes a brush of flux, a drip of lead and heat to join these two bodies into one piece. Um, and, I, and I'm going to switch over to... Uh, I'll switch over to my Google Docs, just a sec here. Oh dear, we've momentarily lost Amy. Um, do you see me, or do you do you I, hear me? I can hear you. Do you, you hear me? I see your profile okay. picture. Yeah, I hope that's okay. Um, it's kind of what I have to do here. Okay, fine. Go. Is for that it. okay? Yeah. All right. It's called Storge. I can't tell if the universe sent me my daughter to teach me how to live with another human being all of the time, or if it was to test me on the many ways to escape from a three-year-old when I don't want to share the last piece of Easter candy, while frantically found while frantically whipping Barbie dolls into the toy box, hollering, put your dolls away, while stepping on accessories that are sharper than the com comebacks she'll come up with around the time we all hope to elect America's version of Greta Thunberg. I'm hopeful that by then I'll have settled into this role of motherhood and that I'll get to share with my daughter all the things she taught me so long ago. This yep. one is okay. called Gloria. Gloria, I found out what I loved and you waved your toddler fingers through a blade of glass so green we both swore in pain. Oh mommy, oh sorrow, 
I'll never laugh again, I thought. And then you tickled my rib cage, hopped on the kitchen table, and danced until you were done. But that's the thing about motherhood. It never ends. Even after everyone's dead and gone, someone is bound to dig their little fingers deep into the sandy glass wave and awaken a chance to discover what love could be. On a wire. My boss must be a ventriloquist when she told me that I have allergies and to come in to work. What I heard inside of the death rattle that was once a lullaby before a virus took over my lungs was class action lawsuit. No amount of money can bring a child back into her mother's arms. How far must I dig for shelter from the storm inside? My chest held the key to release, and each door was a flower, blooming red spots on a map that was more blood than people, more dirge than song. It happened when I turned to you and said, this is our purpose. This is how we right the wrong. Um, and uh, um, how many I don't know uh, how many more do you want me to read here? <laughs> one, or, one or two was good. One or two more? Okay. All right. All right. This one's called On the Show. Um, and the show is a show on NPR. Uh, um, um, I'm not sure, it, I think it's like a, a local NPR kind of show. I'm not sure if everyone gets the show with Robin Young or if it's just Phoenix, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's called On the Show. Bet Robin Young wasn't expecting it when Mary Carr shared about the time when she was babysitting Etheridge Knight's kids and Galway Canal put her hand on his unit. It wasn't at the end of an interview on NPR about Carr's last book of poems. And suddenly, Carr started talking about rape acceptance culture. She said, Canal put her hand on his unit and that she stood up and left the room. She didn't mention anything about Me Too or Weinstein, or Matt Lauer, or Dr. Larry Nasser. She just felt like it was important to point out that she had every right to stay in the room. Robin quickly ended, ended the interview and thanked Mary for coming on the show. Mary was one of those rare ones who didn't say, thank you for having me. Instead, she replied, you're welcome. And I'll do one more. Um, it's called Bucket List. If I get cancer, I'll quit my job and go to India and bathe with elephants she said, and then kept falling down the rabid hole. It was the right size and made for people who fake their way down the aisle to get a rose or a ring or a friend request. Don't wait for cancer to go to India, he said. 
before selling all his furniture to her so he could live his life the way he always wanted. All I'm right. sorry that I wasn't able to show my face while reading a lot of those books. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Thanks, Amy. You're doing the best. Ugin. Ugin. Amy so Ugin. good to hear you. All right. All right. Moving right along. Our next reader is Amy Barone, and her latest poetry collection, We Became Summer, from New York Quarterly Books, was released in 2018. She wrote the chapbooks Kamikaze Dance, Views from the Driveway, and her poetry has appeared in Live Mag, that guy's mag, Local Knowledge, the Patterson Literary Review, oh, what do you know, Sensitive Skin, and Standpoint, among other pop publications. Barone spent five years in Milan as the Italian correspondent for Women's Wear Daily and Advertising Age. She belongs to Pan America Center and the Brevitas Online Poetry Community from Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. She lives in New York City. And here she is, Amy Barone. Hi. I'm not far from Bryn Mawr, so I'm. Um... I'm going to start out with a poem from Kamikaze Dance. It kind of explains where I am. It's called Inheritance. At my mother's house, children's laughter no longer rings through sunlit rooms. The family of one has settled in. Days are long here. Nature bewitches. Fall's brilliant yellow leaves shine on rainy days. Barrenness of winter doesn't disappoint. Spring's lush green uplifts the darkest mood. On muggy summer nights, crickets hold concerts that lull me to sleep. At my mother's house, I write warnings from my Haverford Haven. A collage of sentiments stains loose leaf journals. We're both now free from the familial thunder. In my mother's house, I finally have a vacation home, only two hours away but far from the Chiasso of New York City. At my mother's house, some nights I hear moaning, but it can't be her, for I see the shadow of her stunning smile everywhere there's beauty. At my mother's house, I wonder if she was ever lonely, although she knew all the neighbors, made new friends each year, many of whom I now call family. My mother adored her last home, the place she was happiest was not with my father. It was in his afterlife when she glowed the most. Hey, Amy. And um, could you, could, yes. Could you adjust your screen a little bit? The top of your head is being cut off. If you look in the box. Oh. Yeah. Is that is that okay? That's good, like that. Yeah. Um, when you lean okay, forward, the, the, you're missing the top half of your head. Oh, okay. So this is fine. Yeah. Okay, um, the next poem is, uh, it's a new poem. It's called Blood Orange Days. It's the beginning of spring, damp days and spirits echo winter. Working remotely, I wait for the phone to ring. Familiar street noises have dimmed. Neighbors on walks timidly greet or cross the street. Trees are shrouded in white wisps. The wind stopped whining, a weather vane that hasn't moved in days shifts south. Reports of illness and death pepper my Facebook feed. I grieve with Giovanna, an Italian friend in Brooklyn, who buried her father and uncle in Bergamo from afar. Poets Vittorio Repetto and Bob Barsi have passed on. Little Italy butcher Mo Albanese, shy of 96 years, is gone. People crave communion. In other cycles, yellow daffodils stand tall. The perfume of violet hyacinths evokes a calmer time in the bigger world when travel meant weekends at the Jersey Shore. Pink blossoms on Japanese maples and weeping willows color the town. The sun shadow shelters leafless trees. A sole ambulance siren 
slices the piece. And um, I have a new manuscript that um, I'm shopping around. I'm on, I'm no hurry to publish it. It's called Define Extinction. And I'll be reading several pieces from that. This is called Getting in Tune. Surviving takes practice. It took decades to know you were better off without them. Though Italians are supposed to love family. Tunes tingle memory. Less can be best. Break rules. Tear down the walls of exile. Expel the darkness like bees do every spring. Build the queue. Banish the muse. Write for a few. Date music, not musicians. Tune in on you. And keeping with the theme of music, this is called Queen of Tone. Abigail Ibarra didn't live nine lives. She stopped at one. Her job spanned over 50 years at Fender Guitars, where small nimble hands of a Latino teen made waves. A pickup winder, she advanced from work and soldering and lit a path for other young women who found joy in a unique job. Striving for brilliance, her electric guitars mesmerized legions of fans and radicalized the sound of rock music. She drew demand from Jimi Hendrix, Joan Jett, Eric Clapton, who relied on her handcrafted pickups for their edgy sound. A legacy with measure, they say she wound guitar wire that would have circled the world 16 times. And um, the next two poems are from my latest collection, We Became Summer, from New York Quarterly Books. This is also, this is from the music section. It's called Romance Chelsea Style. We met in our apartment building. Once I saw the sheathed guitar, I prayed he wasn't gay. Then he kissed me on the subway after our first date at Maxwell's. He kept a pad and pen in his pocket, an appendage to his heart. He spoke to me in melody, buried questions in verse. He turned me on to songwriters he idolized, Robin Hitchcock, Juliana Hatfield, Jane Sibbery. On my birthday, he gave me a gift that will last forever, a nameless song that called me the brightest star. It took years to wean myself off him, much longer than it took him to quit the needle. And since Sunday is Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day to the moms out there, I was gonna read, a, I'm gonna read a poem uh, inspired by my mother. It's called City on a River. What Chester made no longer makes Chester. Scott Paper, Ford Motor Company, left for sunnier climes. Light replaced a factory town flanked by a shipyard and ethnic neighborhoods that glowed. Before communities dismantled and racial clamor told, mapping out his peace plan, Martin Luther King chose the city for divinity studies at Crozer Seminary. Landmarks of learning endure like Pennsylvania Military College, now Widener University, and Chester High School. I pour over my mother's yellowed letters. Chester High students credit their old English teacher for love of reading, guidance, success. I feel a flicker of her hometown allure. Change reigns lightly. A national soccer team built a stadium in the city's largest park. Games sell out. Craters glide by. The glistening Delaware River reflects the stars. And uh, this next poem is a short one called Lessons. He invites me to his villa in Tivoli, presses me to love fluidly. If not, how do you know? We both love horses, storytelling, the eternal city. We are poor, wicked lovers and fickle friends. Right of love, not war. Right of the heart's traitors, not politicians. Despite a gap of over 2,000 years, ages after the rise and fall of Rome, Catullus 
gives me writing lessons. Uh, this next piece is fairly new. It's called Medea's Cameo. I wonder if Medea wore a Carl Cameo when she embarked on the journey with Jason, seeking passion and gold. A brooch revealing Athena on a raised relief, an ancient campaign button of hope, an amulet for an enchantress who divined. Under a watery sky, did she dance to win songs on the hunt for treasure? Did she regret her treatment of the king? Love is love, it nurtures and heals, but pride can trample hearts. And when revenge turns gruesome, a magical charm can't stop a blazing rage that ignited more than her soul. And um, this next one is called Strawberry Moon. I think it's a full moon tonight. Uh, the vibrant low moon shadowed a day flooded with sunshine. How many in the city teeming with tourists and bustling locals more attuned to their iPhones than a Native American celebration knew it marked the start of the hay harvest. In Manhattan, Kansas, by the light of a moon-tinged orange-yellow, farmers rose at 4 a.m. to prep for a day of cutting and baling feed. Just as the Algonquins on reserves in the Ottawa River Valley once gathered strawberry roots and leaves in the brief season to brew potions, nature devoted poets fired up their computers to pen odes to the solstice. Saturn, in the glow of a rose moon, nearly brushed elbows with earth. A slight hush fell over New York City as spring handed summer the torch. Forgetting. Friends and lovers should be stamped with an expiration date to forewarn us when the end approaches. I need to brace myself better for betrayal, a nasty outburst, the monster rearing his head. So to sharpen the art of forgetting, I enter a small room that overlooks a tangle of trees and orange azaleas. Warmed by an espresso macchiato, I struggle to remember the magic to touch this gypsy soul and stay locked away until I erase the how, the why forever. And I vow to take faith in the now and head to the river Lethe for a swim. Um, I'm going to end with two poems again. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Bernard. Um, this next poem uh, was featured with sensitive skin last year for Poetry Month. It's called Survivors. Cowhows reemerged on Bermuda's Nonsuch Island after a 300 year absence. They thrive amid native flora, wildlife, and limited access to man. Tangier Island in the middle of Chesapeake Bay supplies the world with soft shell crab, where water defines life, where home and country matter. Shadow box, oh, the piping plover hailed one day each summer for its resurgence in the Rockaways, New York, lives protected in camouflage nests on the beach. Shadow boxing Arctic cares, clinging jellyfish, Bone beds and badlands on fossil freeway in South Dakota. Me, I'm the woman with medicine in her voice, a forest bather, mating like a corpse plant, melting into time, floating for the twelfth life like a trumpeter swan. And I'm going to end with Barda. They're up there in transition sandwiched between old and new lives, floating, attachment dissolving, but turning pure. They'll become who they're meant to be as long as they have the grit to conclude unfinished business, journey on. The next time I chat up clouds of horses and unicorns, I'll be more respectful of friends and family. Speaking to stars is never in vain. 
Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. you are awesome. Lovely. And, yeah. And uh, uh the stars. All right. I gotta mute you all again. See ya. All right. Oh, I forgot to wish everybody a happy Siete de Mayo today, by the way. And mil grazie, mil grazie, Amy. All right, our next reader. I hope he's ready. He was still working when we started. He's ready? Beautiful. All right. John S. Hall is a spoken, a poet, spoken word artist, musician, if ukulele counts, and singer songwriter. He has released numerous albums of various quality and popularity, including nine albums of various incarnations of his band, King Missile. He has appeared on Deaf Poetry Jam on HBO, the United States of Poetry on PBS, and by far the most impressive on Beavis and Butthead on MTV. He's performed in Europe, New Zealand, Canada, and all over the United States. He's the author of a collection of poetry Jesus was way cool and a self-help parody, Daily Negations. And I enjoy your uh, videos of the Daily Negations on Facebook. You guys should check it out. Both of those are on Soft Skull Press. And more recently, over 100 unpublished children's stories. He served on the board of directors of the Poetry Project, St. Mark's Church from 2005 to 2016, and was its president for three years. All right. Without now, further ado, here is John S. Hall. Hi, hi. Um, so uh, I didn't realize my introduction was so long. Um, uh, today, I'm going to just limit myself to things I've written since last Sunday. Um, so this was written on Sunday. This is the only thing I wrote on Sunday. Um, I wrote it Sunday morning um, and on Sunday evening, I got an email from the Satanic Temple asking me if I'd like to contribute on a regular basis to their newsletter. So I sent them this, because, you know, same day. And, and so this is going to appear in uh, the next Satanic Temple newsletter. Um, um, so I thought, uh, Bernard, I hope this is okay. I'm going to just, you know, like how Amy had. So I'm just going to like hold up the devil card from the Crowley deck instead of, uh, okay. So, no, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, the messenger. It has been said that God has created the heavens and the earth. It is also, it has been said so many, many times. It has also been said that God is dead and that there is no God and that there never was. It has been said that God is everything, that God is nothing and that God is love. It has been said that there is a unity that connects all living and non-living things, connects everything that exists and does not exist, connects every idea ever imagined and everything that can't be imagined. There's a pile of stuff somewhere far away. It is among the many things that can never be imagined. None of us will ever imagine any of that stuff. There are so many things that are not among those things that can't be imagined and more of them come into being every moment. A small child imagines a duck that speaks French to sandwiches. An old man imagines a voice from the mountains and the sea that sounds like lemonade and looks like lava. A mother of three imagines a government run entirely by God, not a caliphate, not a Judeo-Christian oligarchy, but rather a system where the governing entities sit around and wait for the word and then they implement the word. It is said that God is infinite, but since the infinite contains the finite, there must be aspects of God that are limited and bounded. All I know is I didn't write any of this. I woke up on Monday and it arrived in an email from God at God.God. I took it as a sign from God, of course. Don't blame me. I am only the messenger. Okay. And then uh, this was written uh, on Monday, May 4th. It's called the novel coronavirus. Uh, and um, here goes. Another beautiful fucking day. I hear birds. The traffic noise is calm and soothing. The sun is bright, but not oppressively so. The temperature is pleasant, but there are a million motherfuckers walking around without masks. So I will stay inside and catch up on my reading. 
I don't have to think of this as tragic. I can pretend it is last year when I spent many, many beautiful days indoors because I felt like staying in and binge watching something or reading a book. I will pretend that this is a choice that I'm making today. I will pretend that I am not afraid of catching the novel coronavirus. I will instead wonder why it is often referred to as the novel coronavirus. I will think about writing coronavirus, the novel, but then decide not to because probably there are many, very many people already doing that. Okay, now we move on to Tuesday where I was more prolific. Um, um, I think I wrote, uh, uh, at well, I wrote two things, it looks like, or three. Okay, this is, no, it looks like two. This is called the fairy story. I stand before the wall impenetrable, seeking a way in, yearning for direction, a guide to the impossible, an intimate knowledge of the myth of syphilis. Desire guides me through a path that cuts through my interior and burrows down to the still pool of calm, the eye in the center of the storm. Who will challenge me is no longer the question. Rather, the question is, how will the wall fall? There is no question, but that it will fall. In time, all things pass. Is what is needed merely an acute sense of timing? Or is something more required? The ability to stand outside of time, to swim in the waters of absolute infinities, to hold one's breath until everything disintegrates and reintegrates. I have no fucking clue. I'm making this all up. There is no escape. I remain here until the end, which will come in just another sentence or two, as this has already grown, grown tiresome, tedious, and trite. Does this child that has emerged from my fingertips feel a sense of abandonment or betrayal? Is there any sense or sentience in the emitted pixels? Perhaps the child knows more than the father and will take its revenge when I grow complacent. And I have already grown quite complacent. Enough of this indulgence. It is time for the fairy story. The fairy floated above the hut where lived a young mother in abject misery. The baby boy was robust, intelligent, and serene. The mother suffered from postpartum depression and the father was hapless, not the word I actually want, and inept, the word I actually want. The fairy observed this tableau for a brief moment, but as she didn't want to prolong the mother's suffering more than one brief moment, she waved her hand and said, toodaloo. Instantly, the postpartum depression vanished. Violins and violas began a soulful, cheery tune from out of infinite space, and all was happy and peaceful in the hut from that time forward, the end. The fairy story was indulgent too. So far, it has been a day of indulgence. It is truly time to begin. The end. Okay, and then the second one that I wrote uh, uh, on May 5th is, um, oh, I wrote it uh, in the evening. It's called Reading Series Number 17, Introductions in Five Parts. Part one. I could not believe how long the writer took to introduce himself and explain the background behind the excerpt of his novel that he was about to read eventually. Part two. The excerpt he read was shorter than the introduction and now he's introducing the next excerpt. Part three. I am well aware that I'm not being very nice right now. Sometimes I'm not very nice. Part four, in case you were wondering, his second excerpt was significantly longer than his second introduction. Part five, I actually liked this writer. All right, now we're on to uh, yesterday. I wrote five or six things yesterday. I had trouble counting them. Um, this one is called Hatfields and McCoy. And McCoys, Hatfields and McCoys. And I forgot to say that one of the things I wrote yesterday uh, is a song. Uh, so, so, so uh, if you're getting tired of hearing me speak, uh, just be forewarned that you will soon have to endure the agony of listening to me sing. Hatfields and McCoys. Oh, if only you knew, if only you could just look at me and know without me having to say a word because I won't be saying a word. I won't be saying a word about it. I will continue on as if nothing had happened, hoping you will do the same. There have always been oceans of emotion, but I will not be the one to point fingers or name names or call something out for what it is. And yet I want you to know, I want to be able to convey the information, the feelings, the thoughts, the tentative conclusions without speaking, maybe by emitting it, by emitting it out of my pineal gland or something. 
but I am no Shiva. I am not even an Arjuna. When Krishna calls me to come and slay my brethren at the field of the Kurus, I will say, fuck you, Krishna. I don't care who sits on the throne of Hastinapura. I am not taking on all that bad karma just because you say it's my dharma. Because what if dharma is just some sort of made up justification to get people to fight wars? It is my understanding that this whole fucking war started over a goddamn game of dice. That's fucking crazy. Oh, and now it's time for the song. I don't think I have a name. We lost your audio, John. John, we lost your audio. Can't hear you. I can't hear you. John, can you hear me? There we go. A poet who goes on and is subject to rebuke. Poet who goes on and on is subject to rebuke. So it's a very lucky thing I've learned to play the uke. Now when I fear my reading may go on a bit too long, I can break things up a little with a happy song. So this is my song to hopefully make my reading less boring Cause I have no desire to hear any of you snoring Of course you are all muted so I wouldn't actually hear a sound But I probably would notice if you decided not to hang around This is my song, this is my song, I hope that it's okay if you still are watching, I hope you're happy that you stay. Listening to a poetry reading can be quite a chore. And after this song, maybe I will have a little more. Okay, next. This, uh, this was also written yesterday. It's called Reflection. <clears throat> It was wrong of me to have promised that there would be a song. It was a reflection of my lack of self-confidence. I say it was wrong and it was a reflection, but at the time of this writing, late Wednesday afternoon, I haven't made the promise yet, but I know I will. I know that when I look at these pages and pages of writing, I will want to, before I begin, reassure and see, I meant to do it before I began, but then I did something else. Re reassure whoever is listening with the promise of a song to break up the monotony. I am aware that some people don't find me as monotonous as I find myself, but I am also aware that many people find me more monotonous than I find myself. And really, probably the important thing is that I don't find myself monotonous when I am doing this tomorrow. Will the promise of the upcoming song, which by the time I am reading this will no longer be upcoming, but will be gone, will the promise of the song help me to think of myself and my reading as less monotonous? Is that even what I should be trying to do? Sometimes I think my impatience with myself makes me more interesting than I might otherwise be. But who knows, if I were calm and patient and more forgiving, maybe I'd be totally fucking awesome. Oh, I fucking hate this. Next. All right. Now, where are we? Did we finish May 6th? No. One more for May 6th. And then I think I only wrote one today. So we're almost done. Two more. This is called Bender. She was moderately bummed that she hadn't written anything about sex in a long time. She had noticed that in the past, she wrote most often about sex when she hadn't had any in a while, but she had not had any in a while and yet she had not written anything about sex. Was she losing her sex drive? She thought about how, if a man were writing her story, he might think the idea of her losing her sex drive would be a tragedy, but she didn't think so. But she also didn't think she was losing her sex drive. Rather, she thought it had to be something else. She thought about the last time she had had sex. It hadn't been terrible, which was comforting to her. If she had to be heterosexual, and apparently she had to be, she was relieved to recall that some men actually did have some sense of what they were doing sexually. As she considered this, she began to get turned on. She decided to give Bender a try. 
according to the description, Bender is a multi-speed, waterproof, body-safe, flexible internal vibrator with magnetic USB charging capabilities. The flexible body of the Vibe is ideally suited for G-spot, clitoral, or overall external simulation, stimulation and features 10 speeds and patterns. She set it to the first speed and then quickly went up to the fourth speed. She enjoyed herself immensely. She decided she was going to be just fine. Okay, I got one more. I hope I didn't go over time. Uh, Bernard said I could go 15. I think I've only gone, well, I've gone 15. Um, so, one more, one more. So one more. more. This sucks though. This is the only thing I wrote today and, and it sucks. It's another <laughs> song. I think I like the chords better for this song, but it sucks. It's called One Last Thing. I tried to write four other things and, and finally said, this is the best I can do. And it's really not good. If I could just write one last thing. Oh, what happiness that would bring. Something to speak or something to sing. I just want to write one last thing. The reading is but hours away. Maybe I've said all I can say. Sometimes inspiration is a bird on the wing. I just want to write one last thing, one last thing, and hopefully it's okay. One last thing, then I can go on with my day. One last thing, if I can find the power. One last thing, then I can take a shower. This is the fourth time today I tried to write. I'm out of time now, gotta give up the fight. Thank you for listening to me speak and sing. I hope you enjoyed my one last thing. Thank you, Bernard, for asking me and inspiring me to write so much stuff. Thanks, John. John. Thanks, John. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Thanks so much to Amy. That was awesome. and Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Sorry, I hope I apologize if I can for Bernard. Thank you. Thank you so much. For well, thank every... you all. Thank you all. I'm going to meet you all for one more quick second here. Here, if you want to support us, here, buy a copy of this. It's on Amazon and it's on sale. It's only like 13 bucks now for some reason. And it's like, there's all sorts of good goodness in here. And uh, yeah, so it's good. Go get it. All right. And thanks everybody for coming, especially our regular guests. iPhone is here again, happy to see. And there's somebody on here, somebody on here named STQ capital Q seven U forward slash plus sign zero A nine T T V capital T. I'm assuming you're one of Elon Musk's children. Thank you. And uh, all right. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you live your life in peace and don't touch your face. <laughs> 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 <laughs>